that on here? Uh, right here. Nope. Here. That, that doesn't even matter. Okay. Okay. All right. Super. Um, thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Milliard Museum. Uh, my name is John Clayton. I'm the executive director, and I've made a habit out of beginning my remarks with this question. Uh, how many of you are here at the Milliard Museum for the first time? Please raise your hand. Okay, pretty good. You can't say that again, right? We got you. We'll get you back here again. Uh, welcome to uh, National Free Comic Book Day, uh, an event I knew nothing about until our Daniel Peters said we should do a special event on National Free Comic Book Day. So lo and behold, here we are to celebrate the legend of Archie, Archie Andrews. Uh, we are joined in this venture by Double Midnight Comics. They are uh, located on Valley Street, and they were good enough to donate comic books for us to give to you for free, hence National Free Comic Book Day. Uh, but you had to pay to come here, and we appreciate your being here. When I was a kid, and I think you all know how much I love Manchester, but I harbored a secret desire. I really wanted to live in Riverdale. I wanted to hang out with Archie. You know, Archie Andrews, that perpetually high school junior uh, who provided a daily basis that Riverdale was better than the male fantasy island, and that the women there, Betty and Veronica in particular, uh, actually fought over the men. This was a good thing as a teenager. Uh, and that remains one of the ultimate Rorschach tests of who you are as a man. Uh, the Betty or Veronica is an ex existential question that predates Marion and Ginger, uh, and it remains a question for the ages. Today we're lucky to have uh, Lynn Montana, the daughter of Archie creator Bob Montana, here with us to talk about the legacy of Archie and the incredible brilliance of her dad. But before we do that, our good friends at Chronicle uh, authored a piece about Bob Montana that aired uh, a little while ago, and Lynn was good enough to bring that with us. So when Dan hits play, uh, we'll start the program uh, by watching the Chronicle tribute to Bob Montana. spent summers as a boy with his rival parents. Meredith was a favorite place for Bob and Cambridge to spend their summers, so Bob's lifetime connections with New Hampshire not only gave him a stimulating place to warn, but also provided him with experiences that ended up in the comic strip. Service as well. 
both of which can be attested to by this group of friends who never produce a chip meal in their life. I'd go to bed about 11.30 at night after listening to 11 o'clock news, and I'd look out my kitchen window and cross watch. You can see Montana down at his drawing table with his head in his hand. Get up at 6.30 in the morning and look out. Here's Montana still sitting in the drawing board with his head in his hand, and I said to the wife, I don't think that guy ever sleeps. It was always a treat when he came in the post office because he was always the same. And uh, I would like, I always had a joke. Anecdote of some sort. Uh, all I can say is that uh, Bob was uh, everybody's friend, and almost everyone in town knew him. So he was uh, a lot of fun. He always, always had things jumping. Yeah. I ran a local service station, and uh, my only involvement with Bob was through the business and knowing him personally. And, uh, I was in a couple of the scripts throughout the years, so... Uh, Have you lost weight since then? Considerable, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, I didn't smoke a cigar, but he always had a cigar in my mouth. But it was just a little something that he added. And it, it was a treat to see him daily when he came in. Now, were you, did you end up being in, in any of the characters? Mm -hmm. oh, yes, yeah. as, as the postmaster. scuba diving probably when he was 50. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He tried yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. He wanted to you know. experience everything there was in life. Well, it was yeah. just a big yeah. adventure. You all were along for the ride, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah, we've been riding along ever since. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't stop. He took you off to other countries as well, right? Yes, yeah. that was just great. Just for the experience. Well, it was good because he could work anywhere in the world. He just needed a post office box to mail in the script every week. Yeah. And that was, so he could live, he could live in and he's had to stay for two years at a time in each country. And so we got to go to those local schools and uh, mm -hmm. gave us an opportunity to really get to know the people and the culture and even the language yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. you know, learn a lot about you know, other people that live in different countries. And it was a great option. One of my favorite memories growing up is around the dinner table after Dad had been up in the studio all day and he'd come down and try his gags out that he'd written, see if he got a laugh. Mm -hmm. you know, create this person every day without it becoming you and, and he was Archie. You know, well, Archie, wouldn't admit that. Archie wasn't, well, if Archie was a teenager, then I guess my dad was perpetually a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> you know, children, they would have a uh, paper hooked up on the wall here. And if they had funny situations or something happened at school, like the coach almost swallowed his whistle, that sort of thing. They just write it down. This is a self portrait of Bob. It shows how important Archie was in his life. But what it doesn't show is how important his life was to those around him. That's something that's well preserved to his friends and family. So, silly me, here I am thanking my friends at Carnival for allowing us to use the program, when in fact I should have been thanking myself. 
Uh, as you can recognize that voice, that was mine, uh, doing a piece for New Hampshire Crossroads back in 1997. So in any case, what it's done is set us up for what we hope is a grand visit with Lynn Montana. Archie, as you know, was published in more than 700 newspapers during its height of its syndication. Uh, he is the most best-selling non-superhero comic in the history of the world, and we are blessed to have uh, Bob Montana's daughter, Lynn Montana, here to join us. She was the elegant woman with the black hair in the, in the photo, and you're now seeing contemporary visions of me uh, and Lynn at the same time. So please welcome Lynn Montana. makes me feel really old. <laughs> um, it was 28 years ago that film was taken. Um, and my mother's passed on now. Um, and my sister, who wasn't even in the film, is now in her 70s. I'm not there yet, but... Um, I guess usually I ask for questions first to get me started. Um, uh, the reason we even did this first TV spot here with John and Crossroads and everything was because there wasn't anything in the state at all that kind of recognized my dad. And we thought it'd be good to have a little something. John came up and did a great little piece on him. Years later, in 2013, a woman named Carol Anderson wrote a biography of my father. And uh, when it came out, um, Chronicle uh, TV program Chronicle came up and did some footage on it too, which was a nice show. But apparently that DVD wasn't functioning, so it didn't get showed. But anyway, if anybody has any questions to kind of get the ball rolling, yes. Okay, we had a family place all over Slot in Fish Cove right near you. Yes, we yes. The house all the time. Yes. We always got the boat service and everything. It's Chef Brown's boat basin. Yeah. We did Your too. father had a beautiful old sloop there. He did. What year was it that the boat was manufactured, you know? The boat was, I think, built in the 30s. It was a friendship sloop. Yeah, that's what it was, friendship sloop. A friendship sloop, which, for whatever anybody doesn't know, actually was a fishing vessel that was ocean going. And it came over from Maine. Um, Gonna say somewhere up near Friendship or Camden, Maine. Oh, okay. It was the it was the sailboat that was used in the movie, um, the musical, um, Carousel. Oh. And it was the boat that was used. I don't know if how many of you remember the musical Carousel with Goulet, um, Robert Goulet was yeah. in it. Um, they ferried some people over to an island to pick blueberries, and that was one of the boats. Um, but anyway, my father bought it and brought it over to Lake Winnipesaukee and sailed it on the lake. He brought it over in the 50s. I have to say, it's an absolute gorgeous boat. It was the most photographed sailboat on the lake for quite a while, from what I understand, because it really was quite spectacular. There's nothing else like it on the lake at the time. Yes, John. Um, I understand that Miss Beasley, uh, the cafeteria crone, you all remember from Archie Comics, uh, underwent a, a beauty process that did not go well with the readers. Does that ring a bell? Yes. Um, people were writing in and saying, why does Miss Beasley, yo, I know what it was. It was the like the union of um, school cooks or some organization of school cooks that were writing to my father saying, why do you have to portray us as being so ugly, you know, with Miss, like Miss Beasley? So my father said, all right, well, we'll, we'll get a new cook in. So he got in this new one, and, um, and he just created a new character. And she was lovely and pretty and whatever. And uh, he got all this fan mail, not from cooks, but from everybody else. <laughs> and they said, no, no. We want the old Miss Beasley back. <laughs> so we had to get rid of the pretty one and bring Miss Beasley back. She was far more popular. And uh, I mean, if you think about it, what was going to have to happen? I mean, the coffee was going to have to get better. And <laughs> Mr. Weatherby would never have anything to complain about when he was in the food line. <laughs> you know, it's just a lot of things change. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, right here in the front. I, I saw in the uh, video that 
the man at the service station was truly patterned after a real person and facial resemblance. Uh, yes. Were there others like that? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, and does that go as far as Betty and Veronica? Uh, well, I mean, these were characters in and of their own right in the strip. Yes. They didn't look like anybody else. Oh, so the, so the gas station guy sure looked like the person who said he ran the gas station. Well, that was. That was yeah. him in okay. the strip. I mean, my father yes. just portrayed well, well, him. Were, were there other people like that? Yes, there were. There was, a, there was a gentleman who ran the local tra uh, tra tractor shop, um, and they called him Big Buck Bucklin. So you can imagine what he looked like. I mean, he was like, looked like the number one football coach. You know, he was huge and muscular. And I remember him actually going there as a child. And then we had, um, there would be, you know, school teachers that would get in the strip occasionally. And um, there were ca people that we, um, that we visited with and uh, met um, <coughs> over, overseas in Europe. Um, I remember we were in Spain for one Christmas and there was uh, a couple of sort of cosmopolitan young Americans who, were in the next villa, but living in Paris and down for the holidays. And uh, they got put in the strip, you know, with their berets and their goatees and beards and long hair, and they were artists, <laughs> so they were in there. Um, so anybody that he found he could portray in an amusing fashion would, could get into the strip. I, I uh, just gave a speech, a speech, a talk like this, um, about a month ago at a senior center in Concord. And one of the fellows that was there, I immediately recognized him. It was um, Alan Israel, who used to own the pharmacy in town. And Alan had a touch under him. He's in his late 80s now. Uh, of course, my father would be 99 if he was alive. Um, and Alan had tucked under his like three or four framed Archie strips that he was in. And that was the thing, my father would take the original and give it to the whoever it was in town or whoever it was that was portrayed in the strip. So people all around Meredith have strips of themselves on the walls, on their walls, and they always bring them in to any, you know, anything, the gathering, <laughs> to show me. <laughs> yes? Alan is my neighbor. Oh, is he? Yes. Oh, wow. And we just recently, a few of us recently went up to Meredith to see the sculpture of Archie, oh, yeah. and it was just, I mean, it was the best. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Really a great replica, life-size, yeah. sitting on a bench, perfect spot to put it. And it my pleasure. father's Archie, not the new Archie. <laughs> right. <laughs> Coming on, on Netflix these days. Oh, my God. So, yeah, for, fortunately, it would be an Archie that my father would recognize. Yeah. Yes, behind you. I went to the same school, had the same art teacher that your father had. In Haverhill? No, in Manchester. Oh, in Manchester, Central right. High. Manchester, Manchester Central, yeah. Mr. Ryder. And I've heard that about name. About the time that your father was just hitting the big time, I think, because he came in and sat, uh, yeah, no, the art teacher came in and sat next to me and announced that his student who sat right there uh, had been accepted for some uh, business award or something along the way. He said to me, he's going places, don't forget that. <laughs> so here I am all these many years later meeting his daughter. And oh, that's I'm wonderful. very pleased to uh, be aware of your father oh, and his you. accomplishments. Well, that leads me to tell you that um, in, it was 1998 that John had a, a group of people coming to the old museum spot over in, down off Elm Street. Elm Street. And um, they were having a talk by Jeff Cuddy, who was the assistant to my father. In the last five or six years, he was helping my dad uh, basically all he did was pencil the backgrounds and my father still inked everything in. But, um, but Jeff gave a talk and my sister and I had read about it somewhere online and I talked my sister Paige into going down. So we went down to Manchester and we, we just walked in quietly and sat in the back and, and uh, somebody spotted us. I don't know whether it was John or who, but somebody who knew us spotted us. And so after the talk, um, they announced that Bob's daughters were sitting in the audience, so we had to stand up and have an ovation, a standing ovation. And, uh, but it was wonderful. 
there were so many people in that audience. It was a huge audience that night. And there were so many people that had stories about Bob because they were from Manchester and they, there were people that had gone to school. Now this was in 98, so there were still a lot of people alive that had gone to school with him. One lady brought him, she had my father's, a picture of my father's high school senior portrait. We don't even have a copy of a senior <laughs> portrait. And she showed it to me, it was wonderful. These people all had stories about going to Central High with my dad, it was so great. And it was shortly after that that um, my sister and I also went down uh, because, to Manchester because Central, we were invited to that with, with a formal invitation. Um, that they had were giving, they were putting my father into the Manchester Central High Hall of Fame. And would we, would we get up and say something? So of course I'm the one, because my sister doesn't like to get up and say anything. But um, So I got up and I tried to crack a few jokes because that's what my dad would do. Um, and it was kind of funny because everybody else that was, there was about 20 guys that were inducted into the Hall of Fame that night. They were all football players, basketball players, <laughs> hockey players, you name it, but not one of them. They were all athletics, you know, people, and my father was the only cartoonist. I got a kick out of that. But um, he always told a story about Central High, and that was that um, some, one of his other teachers, math, English, one of his not-so-favorite subjects, um, sent him to the principal's office because my dad was always doodling on the side of his notebooks. And he went to the principal and the principal said, if you don't stop drawing, you're never going to amount to anything. <laughs> Fortunately, he didn't listen to the principal, which most of us don't anyway, right? So that was kind of cute. But I do remember Ry Ryder's name. Yes. I remember my father talking about him as his art teacher. Yeah. Well, the reason you found out about that exhibit at the old uh, Manchester Historic Association is because you read about it in the Union Leader. I wrote it. Okay. And so this is the column I've oh, written about that event. And this is in one of my books as well. So I made copies for all of you. So before you leave, oh, uh, you. take this pocket history of Bob Montana home with you. Oh, and I have that book. Yeah. <laughs> and we have those illustrations as well, which you can take home and color on your own. Uh, test yourself so you can get that right orange for Archie's oh. hair. <laughs> it's a tough match. He would be called a ginger today because of his hair color. So. Carrot top. Carrot top. And Lynn also brought a lot of artifacts you're welcome to enjoy before you leave. Uh, don't take them, please. <laughs> take a comic book, take one of these, but don't take They're the artifacts. They're probably going to end up here sooner or later because that is my plan to get the family to donate the archives. And we encourage that. To the right. museum. Feel free to join in. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Haverhill. I mean, my father did go to Haverhill High for three years. He only went to Manchester Central for one. But this is New Hampshire, and New Hampshire was his home. And Haverhill doesn't have a museum like this that I know of. And they just have a small archive of stuff that we have given them over the years, um, that my mother did, actually, um, in the library. And I went down to the library there a while back and tried to find the stuff. And I don't know, it was just not even, they couldn't even find it. So I thought, hmm, I think I'm going to give it to John. <laughs> Have him take care of it here sure. at the museum. I'm sure it'll be much better. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Tara. Lynn, can you tell us about your your grandfather? A little snippet about your father in his very early ages. And my grandfather um, was actually he was famous in his own right. His name was Ray Montana. My brother's named after him, and he was the um, most famous solo instrumental um, musician playing in the vaudeville circuit in the 20s and 30s and 40s. He was. He was. He actually I even got went over and played before King George um, in the would would have been in the um, 20s. Um, and he was very well known. And he traveled all over the country. And he, of course, he had his his wife, my, my grandmother, Roberta, and the two kitties. And the two kitties were my uncle, my, my, my father and my aunt Ruth. Ruth was two years older than my father. But when my father was like five years old, he and his sister were up on stage doing a family routine uh, in, the vaude, in the vaudeville uh, 
theaters. And they traveled all over the country by train. I mean, my, my father was actually born en route to California. He was born in Stockton, California. At some point, they stopped overnight at a theater, I don't know. Um, and he used to say that when they weren't on the train, of course, they were backstage, and then they were in hotels, cheap, cheaper hotels. But And he grew up for the first three years sleeping in a drawer in a cupboard in a, in a hotel room like they did back in the 20s and 30s with little kids. Mm -hmm. And he was also um, home taught, homeschooled with the Calvert method. I don't know if any of you remember that, but um, that was the homeschooling method for people back in the early you know, 1900s. Um, and then at 12 years old, his family finally arrived in Meredith, New Hampshire for a summer. And he loved it so much that as things progressed and he ended up with his own family, he was in New York at the time, but he ended up moving to Meredith. But my grandfather um, unfortunately died when my father was 13 years old um, of a heart attack. But um, he, uh, he, he was very popular. I mean, he played the banjo, his banjo is, the Smithsonian is crying out to get hold of his banjo. It's uh, it's a bacon, something in bacon. My brother has it. Um, but my dad grew up backstage in vaudeville, standing in the wings, listening to these vaudeville um, comics, getting up there to the mic and doing their one-liners, you know, where Bob Hope started in vaudeville and um, uh, there's a lot of other ones that started, you know, that were famous comic, com uh, just comedians getting up there and doing their shtick. And as I got older, I started to think to myself that I sort of recognized that um, stage comedian uh, aspect of my father's work. I mean, he would put a joke in almost every panel of the strip. Just a one-liner, which is what he saw up on stage. These guys would throw out these one-line jokes. And, or they'd, they'd do the, the, the pair of comedians where one guy would be the straight guy and the other was the, the fall guy. And um, like Gracie Allen and, and uh, what's his name? George, George, Burns. George Burns and Gracie Allen. You know, she would say the funny thing and he was the straight guy. Well, my, um, so J Archie is the straight guy, and Jughead is the, the fall, you know, he's the silly guy, kind of, except Archie's funny, too, at times, but he's usually not so, he's not saying anything as funny as Jughead does. But they were right off the vaudeville stage, this back and forth, you know, the two, two characters in the strip. And then the drawings of some of the action in the, in the older strips looked a lot like that kind of um, kaboom kind of action on, on, on stage. You know, somebody tripping over something and falling or somebody bumping in and hitting a pie in the face. This kind of, that kind of stage acting um, kind of shows up in his drawings if you look for it. And, um, and then the other thing I realized as I grew older um, was that Betty and Veronica, now women, I'm sure you, hopefully you'll agree with me, I got to the understand, thinking to myself that I think there's a Betty and Veronica in every woman. We all want to be the bavoom, you know, sexy gal, you know, in the right place. And we all want to be the gal that cooks, bakes the cookies, and, you know, is the pretty girl next door. And I, I just, I think he was tapping into something very deep in our women's psyche. I don't know, maybe it wasn't, but it just struck me that I think there's a Betty and a Veronica in all of us, so. <laughs> anyway, any other questions? Yes? Can I ask you to clarify the, um, the mild disagreement over whether Haverhill or Manchester can claim credit to your dad in high school? Because I've heard that both have made the claim. Well, I think my father drew from both places, um, but Riverdale is, Haverhill, in so much as the building, the Haverhill High School is the building in the, in the comic strip. And the statue, the thinker, was outside. Um, and uh, the characters, I think, were drawn more from those times in Haverhill. 
than from Central High. Which city did you spend more time in? Haverhill, three years. Three years in Haverhill, one year in, in, in Central High, and then they went to New York City or Boston or something like that. But he, I mean, I'm sure he had a lot of situations in his senior year too. But in, in Haverhill, he was, um, because he was there so long, he was also um, the artist on their um, local class um, booklet that they put out, the brown, the brown and the gold was the little newsletter or something in the news booklet that they put out in school, and he was the editor or the artist or whatever of it. And, and um, I think he really was, um, very, very moved by his three years in Haver. It was the first time in his life he'd ever stayed anywhere for three years because, you know, in Vaudeville, you just move around and move around and move around. And then after his father died, his mother was always taking them from one apartment to another, depending on whether they could afford. I mean, there was one apartment in New York City where they just packed up and left in the middle of the night uh, because she couldn't afford to pay the rent anymore and um, took him and his sister, they were in their, you know, early teens then, um, after Ray died. And unfortunately, there was one, one apartment, that, that one that they quit in the middle of the night, they had a trunk full of all my grandfather's vaudeville um, dress suits, you know, that he wore on stage. He dressed up like a, a cowboy. Um, and uh, he was just called Montana. That was his stage name. And he had, you know, the whole white cow cowboy uh, outfit. We have a lot of pictures of that. And and he had um, some cult pistols. He had a set of twelve cult pistols. It was a collection. They had to leave all that behind in in the trunk. They couldn't bring the trunk. So we, we never had any of those things from my grandfather, unfortunately. But when you have to scoot in the middle of the night, you leave things behind. So tough, times were tough, and they never lived in one place very long. And then finally, she remarried uh, a fellow that lived in Haverhill, or came from Haverhill, and they settled in Haverhill for three years. And um, that was the longest play, play time he'd ever lived in. He, got to, he actually got to make friends of his own age, which was really important to him, because he was a very shy person. And I think that's part of the drawing and doing the cartoons and everything was because he was so shy. His way of sort of, it, you know, like uh, being out there in the world and stuff was through his cartooning. Yes? What brought the family to Manchester? Work. Work. Um, my dad was born in 1920, so it, it, when the Depression started, um, and through the Depression, um, work was, was very, very important. I mean, you, you went wherever the work was, and they were, they were working class people. They had to go. Things dry up in an area, you pick up and move. I mean, that was just standard for many people in those days. And my father was, I mean, he literally came of age during the Depression. So. And his stepfather was the one. His stepfather had a company company, one man band really, um, that painted signs. He was a sign painter. He painted backgrounds and signs, a lot of theater backgrounds if, if they could get the work. And my father joined him and uh, that kind of was a great start for my dad in um, illustrating and learning to paint. Um, and work with the paints. So he, he worked for his stepdad in, as often as he could. He was right there beside him doing all the artwork. In the uh, heyday, there was an Archie and Jughead radio show, and there was also the cartoon. Yeah. Did your dad have much to do with the creative control of that? No. Um, my, my father, um, he start, when he started the comic book strip, the comic books, but he started working as a freelance artist, and he just went from comic house to comic house. In New York City, they had these comic houses, and they'd hire these guys, they were called the bullpen artists. They'd come in, they'd work for a day, and they'd pay you 25 bucks, and you'd sit there and you'd just turn out work, whatever they gave you. 
And you had to be good enough so that, you know, you could draw Batman just like Batman was supposed to look, you know. And then you'd go over somewhere else and you'd draw some other character in some other comic house. And they just freelance. And my father ended up at a, at a comic house called MLJ. And um, he was there for quite a while and um, drawing their, their comics. And um, of course, in the meantime, at home, he's drawing and coming up with his own comic strip and his own idea. He was only, he was 20 years old when he started working at MLJ, or he was 20 years old when he presented the idea for Archie. He called it Chick. He didn't call it Archie. It was four guys, sort of after the Andy Hardy, or the Hardy boys. Hardy boys. Yeah. And um, this is all before my day, so you have to excuse me. <laughs> memory here. Um, and he brought it to the publisher, the, the head of the comic house, John Goldwater. And um, John suggested that he make it boy girl, two boys, two girls. He thought that would be much more popular and it would re reach a broader market. And he also wanted to call it Archibald after his best friend. My father refused to accept Archibald. He was like, no way. But Archie, he could live with. So instead of Chick and instead of Archibald, it became Archie. And they, he did the strips for, you know, a number of months, and then he got drafted. He got called into the military. I don't know whether he was drafted or he, he enlisted, but you know, World War II hit, and off he went. Um, and during those four years, um, he allowed the comic book house to create the strip without him, but they could never put their name on it um, because it could, was he considered it his, and they they abided by that. Um, when he got back, when he got back to New York, um, what had, what he found out was that the the comic books were. They, the, that particular story, which started in the back of one pep comic, and uh, you know, comic books often have several different stories going on in one comic book. It was so popular um, with fans that they started putting out just Archie comic books, all Archie. And so by the time he got out of the war, they were going gangbusters. Well, one person can't draw a comic book. It takes a lot of people. I mean, right now, Archie Comics Incorporated, in their in their prime, I mean, in their payday, in the biggest time, were, were they had 90 employees working on the comic books. So my father, by that time, he was married. My mother was pregnant with my sister. And he said, I'll just do the comic strip. Let's move into the newspapers. I'll do the strip, which one man could do. And I don't have to be in New York to do the strip. I can go back to Meredith. And that's what he did. He moved back to Meredith with Peg and, and um, did the strip from there, from that point on, for 35 years. So what was the original question? <laughs> <laughs> Told you I get sidetracked. Um, OK, uh, Lynn, when I was doing a radio interview to promote your appearance here today, uh, I was talking about the enduring quality of the Archie characters. Uh, by virtue of a new TV program called Riverdale. It's back in another iteration. But I started thinking back. Uh, the television show Don't Be Gillis, oh, yeah. that was a model based on Archie because you have the clean cut, you know, the guy everybody loves. He's got a beatnik boyfriend or a buddy named Mayor G. Fritz. Yeah. That's a yeah. And it's all centered around the thinker statue, the Rodan statue. And if you think back to Don't Be Gillis, that was a mirror of Archie. And so was Happy Days. Richie Cunningham yes. was Archie. Think about hanging around in Pop's chocolate shop. Well, now it's, what was the name of it? It's Arnold's, Arnold's Diner, yeah. I mean, it, the high school milieu was recreated again. So the, more enduring even than I thought because the model's been copied so often. Yeah, no, that's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. There's been a lot of kind of spin-off spin -off. stories yeah. that have come out of that, that of, of high school, which mm -hmm. was not really that popular a, a subject until then. I mean, Archie. I would say that the comic book, well, I don't say it, it, it was. The market share for the comic book was always 11 to 14-year-old girls. That's who they were trying to reach. Of course, they were reaching 16-year-old boys, too, because they were very interested in Betty and Veronica. But, <laughs> but um, my dad's strip in the newspaper 
I've always felt was ri written for all ages. I mean, kids could read it and maybe get it, but really, it was an adult. It was written for adults. I mean, the jokes and the gags and you know, the storylines. Sometimes you had to be an adult to really appreciate it, and it and it was geared to make adults laugh. I mean, he wanted he wanted to reach to, to the people that were buying the newspapers. Because he grew up, like I said, he grew up in the Depression, he went through the war. Those were not the happiest of days. And people relied on the newspapers and they relied on the comic strips to give them a bit of a laugh. And he really wanted to be a part of that for the rest of his life, which he was. Yes? Was he getting part of the revenue from the comic books as well? No. It was not? No, no. He didn't get revenue from anything but his day-to-day -day work. They always considered him a, uh, an employee, which we didn't, but he could never win that battle right. as much as we tried. Mm -hmm. um, so corporate legal against little town people, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Yes. So did the comic strip stop at his death, or did someone take it over? I can't quite remember that. Uh, they, what they did, I think, was um, they got somebody from in-house to start drawing the comic strips and take it over. And yes, uh, but it went from you know 800 papers internationally down to I don't know, it's minuscule now. I mean, our town newspaper in our town doesn't even carry Archie anymore. I can see why. I mean, I never thought that theirs were very funny, so I can't imagine why they would. But um, yeah, they've kind of faded off into nothing now. And the comic books, too, to some degree. Um, but that was the tail end of John Goldwater. And this new uh, Riverdale Netflix series is um, his grandson, John Goldwater, Jr. Grand or, whatever, his grandson has taken it up. And he's trying to put some new life into it. And one of the ways you do it is you, you appeal to the, you know, the next generation, the generation Xers, or the millennials, I guess they're called. And, and um, I, I've watched the program, and I'm, I'm impressed with it. I think that uh, if that's his goal, and that's what he wants to do, I think he's doing a great job. And I can see why it's a big hit on Netflix to the young, you know, the 30-somethings or the 20-somethings. And, um, hey, all the more power to it. It's not my dad's Archie. You know, it's kind of the Archie on the dark side. But things change. And uh, if they want to keep, if they wanted to keep it alive, something had to change because it was dying the way it was. I think it was. Anyway. Yes. Did your um, father ever use his strip to make any political statements? Um, no, not political, but certainly environmental. He was very, he used it a lot for different environmental things. And some, well, I don't want to say social so much, but, but environmental, he would slip things in, you know, green this and green that, and, you know, Archie and the gang going out to do something, to, you know, collect garbage on the side of the road or something for some organization or whatever. Uh, because he was, he felt very strongly about that. That was a big passion of his was, um, organic farming and uh, Rachel Carson and you know that whole thing. That's about probably the only. And then he also made fashion statements. I mean, <laughs> we were living in England when uh, uh, in the mid 60s, which was kind of a mod period. And you know the, the boys had the tight peg leg pants, you know, and the girls had the short mini skirts that were kind of psychedelic and made out of vinyl and stuff like that, and neon lit, lit up and stuff. And he used to put Veronica in all those latest fashions. He had a lot of fun with them. And being in England, we got to see it. It was all around us, you know, because that all came from London, you know, and, um, first. And then it came over to this country. Um, so he was way ahead of times with his um, 60s fashion at least for American comic strips. And he had a lot of fun with that. Archie grew up <laughs> fashion-wise in, uh, in England, I like to say. Yes? Is the family homestead still in Meredith? Or is 
It is. Um, my mother sold it in 1927, 1997. So she sold it right after, not sure, you know, shortly after you did your program. Um, it was just too much for her, and she was just her and her second husband living there, and they wanted to downsize and everything. And we were all very sad to see it go. I drive by it every single day on the way to town, so but I've gotten over it. It's, it's still there. I remember as a child, I went to, the, Did you? to visit him, to my mother and father knew him, I guess, somehow. I was so young, but I remember going in the house and seeing it on the film. What was, what was her name? Hornung, H-O-R-N-U-N-G. We owned cottages up there in Meredith, Twin Haven. Oh, I recognize Twin Haven. Yeah. Yeah. I don't recognize your Yale parents' Shore. name, but... Yale Shore Road. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, my dad welcomed anybody and we used to have people just drive up the driveway and knock on the door, you know, fans that would come and, uh, you know, couples dragging their, not dragging but by any means, but bringing their nine-year-old, ten-year-old kids who insisted they wanted to be a cartoonist when they grew up, you know, and they wanted them to meet Bob and, and he would take these kids and he would give them original strips and he would tell them, I remember he always used to tell them the same thing, anybody that wanted to be an artist or a cartoonist, and he would say, you have to draw something every day. And my father had these little diaries that he kept when he was 18 and 19, um, and there the family has them, but I think they showed a couple pages in here, and they'll probably eventually end up in the museum, hopefully too. Um, but he had these diaries that he kept, and every single day he would draw something in the diary. Of course, he drew other other time things too. But um, but he would tell people, you have to draw every day, which I'm assuming that's probably correct for most artistic people. You know, if you're a musician, you better be playing your instrument every single day. You know, and if you're, um, but that so I didn't abide by that. So when I thought I was going to be an artist when I grew up, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Missed all those days. <laughs> but yeah, we had a lot of visitors, and, um, and he had a good fan base, too, and he used to answer every single fan letter himself. Yeah. And there was a couple, couple of them. I, I actually, after he died, I was getting letters for a while from an older woman who had written to him dozens of times. I mean, they had this back and forth correspondence. She was like 20 years older than he was. <laughs> <laughs> so, more questions? All right, I think I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that Lynn will be happy to stay around for a while and chat with you all. Yeah, Am for I a correct? little while. Yeah, yeah. And don't forget to get your copy of uh, Back to the Drawing Board from uh, New Hampshire, the way I see it. So, again, I hope my daughter one day is the bearer of my torch in the same way that Lynn carries on the legacy of her dad. Uh, we all should have somebody who's so uh, caring about the the legacy we leave behind. So, Lynn Montana, go oh, please do, yes. Let me just add, if you get a chance, and it's a nice day this summer, drive up to Meredith and check out the statue. It's so much fun, and it's on a bench, so you can sit and have your picture taken with it. And also, there's books that I brought down on the back table um, that are all, you can purchase them all online. And there's a series of uh, three books that have the, a big face of Archie and Veronica and Betty. Uh, they're coming out with Jughead soon. Um, and they are actually, it, there's, it's just solid strips, daily strips. So, and I tell people, it's the only way you're ever going to be able to read the Archie strips again. Mm -hmm. And is to have a book like that and sit and read it. And I, I give them to my local library if anybody's in Meredith. <laughs> but, um, but they're really, it's really fun to read. You get to see the characters, and you get to feel the characters, mm -hmm. you know, through the multiple strips when you're reading them. And who's the young lady who did the more recent book? The Her author? name is Carol Anderson. We have copies of Carol Anderson's book in the gift shop, so you're welcome yeah. to purchase those as well. Yeah. Uh, she does a great job of uh, telling about Bob Montana's Meredith. And it's I actually have book. to credit her book for the reason why there's a statue. Because it was a fellow that moved to Meredith about six years ago. And he read the book, and he said, we got to do something here. There's nothing in Meredith that even mentioned. There wasn't a plaque. There wasn't a stone. There wasn't anything. Not even a brick you know, that, that mentioned my dad. So 
that was, I have to give her a lot of credit for that. Lynn, did you see the photo on Facebook of uh, the statue in this little white dog sitting in front, looking up at it? Like I it put was that on Facebook. A <laughs> you, like it was having a conversation about That was a friend of mine. She brought her little, um, she calls it a, a poodle, or some kind of a pug poodle or something, or poodle pug or some poo pug dog, this little tiny thing, it's sitting on the bench, and it's looking at Archie like this, you know, cocked its head, looking quizzically at it, and so we were trying to think of, um, you know, a line to put underneath the photo as to what this dog was thinking, and it's kind of like, you know, like, who are you? You don't even move. <laughs> you know, like, Why aren't you paying attention to me? <laughs> it was cute. It was cute. Um, so. There was a talk here just a couple of weeks ago by an author of a book documenting every one of the then existing historical markers in New Hampshire. And he described the procedure that one goes through to get another one established. Had you considered doing something like that, spearheading such a movement? No, I hadn't, but somebody should, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I'm a family <laughs> member. It's, it, it, you know, I, I'm, I don't want to step over the line. You know, the family doesn't want to step over the line in promoting my father. You know, I, you know, I mean, I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say, but sure. the family would never have been the one to go out and say, hey, why don't you put a statue in the park, you know? We just wouldn't do that. My father was a very humble, shy guy. He always used to say, I'm not, pop, I'm not famous. Archie's famous, you know. He didn't want a lot of attention drawn to himself. He wanted to just live his nice life on his farm with his kids and his family and his wife, you know. Um, so we're careful what we do. I, I guess um, if there was enough interest from other people to do something like that, I would certainly support it and be happy to be a part of it. But to initiate it, it's kind of like, I, I don't know how to explain this. It's we'll like promoting your own, yeah. tooting your own horn, kind of, you know, I just, anyway, I hope I'm not doing too soon. Where is, this, <laughs> where is the statue in Meredith? It's right uptown on Main Street. You know, you go up to the higher level of the town, not down along the water. And it's right in the center of town. There's a little pocket park, they call it. Yeah. You know, you, you can drive right by it. It's not very big. Um, but it's up on the flat. And we do have photographs of the statue back here, so if you've never seen it, uh, please take a look. Uh, it's the original Archie, complete with bow tie and the sweater vest. Oh, yeah. uh, it's yeah. classic uh, Bob Montana Archie. Yeah. So I want to say thank you to Lynn. Please join me in thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much again. I, I'm sure Lynn will want to stay around and chat with you about your own Archie experience. We all have them. Uh, I mentioned the Betty and Veronica existential dilemma I still wrestle with every day, although I married a tall blonde, so I think I know which side I came down on. Uh, in the meantime, again, uh, please pick up a copy of this column, Back to the Drawing Board. Take the free uh, panels. You can color your own. Uh, take the one comic book. Thanks again to our friends at Double Midnight Comics for providing those. And thank you all for visiting the Milliard Museum. Thank you. Thank you.